We hear now armchair astronomy with members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff talking to WBAI's David W. Teske. This is the 45th in our continuing series of programs on astronomy. Contributing their time and knowledge to this venture are members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff. They come hoping to give us laymen a fuller understanding of our universe. We invite you to participate. If there is an aspect of astronomy that you would like explained or something you hear discussed that is not clear, please indicate your questions and topics by card or letter to Armchair Astronomy, WBAI, 30 East 39th Street, New York 16, New York. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in future programs. On today's program, the topic of the discussion is the physics of Venus. With us today is astronomer Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin, who is in charge of the Planetarium's radio observatory, and Mr. James S. Pickering, assistant astronomer and supervisor of guest relations at the American Museum Hayden Planetarium. Welcome, both of you, and Dr. Franklin, will you begin? Yes, Dave, thank you very much. Venus is very prominent in the sky now, and uh, maybe a lot of people are wondering just what in the world is the nature of that object up there. Doctors Hess and Nicholson of our staff have just about exhausted the topic of how it appears in our sky. Um, perhaps many of our listeners heard that some time ago and uh, are probably now quite aware of the fact that uh, Venus appears in our sky about every 18, 19 months in just about the situation it is now. And next in a few weeks, it'll be the brightest that we'll get in the evening sky. It will be at its very brightest uh, about the middle of December. Now, uh, the problem of observing Venus is rather uh, hard because it is always in our daytime sky, and the nighttime as we can see it uh, here with the uh, Venus shining very brightly uh, forces us to look through a large column of air and the air is very disturbing to the views that we can get of things. Uh, Venus doesn't really help too much when you get right down to it because when you do look at it through a telescope we find out there isn't much to look at. Venus has a surface which is uh, apparently covered with clouds all the time. There has been very little uh, found out about the surface of Venus. Uh, what has been learned has been learned in the last uh, uh, two or three years, and it's rather interesting. One of the problems about Venus, since we can't see anything solid on the surface, is uh, uh, to derive a period of rotation for it. The usual method is to find some feature and then time its appearance and reappearance and the duration is the length of time that a planet takes to rotate but if there's nothing there uh, it's awfully hard to uh, know when to click your watch there have been arguments for rotation periods all the way from about 22 hours to about the same as the period of revolution which now, is 220 225 days? 225 days, once around the sun in that length of time. Now, uh, the short-term period was argued for just a few years ago on the basis of uh, some radio observations that were believed to pertain to the planet. But uh, this was repudiated, and the, uh, uh, the individual who made the observations realized that uh, they did not really pertain to Venus, so uh, he has withdrawn the interpretation. I think it's a very good thing to do. The uh, reason why it cannot have a very rapid rotation period is that uh, we see a perfectly round shape to the planet. Now, you maybe have seen some photographs of the planet and see that it looks like the crescent moon and say, how can I say that it's round? Um, we can observe this body when it is illuminated um, properly by the sun and we can see that every side we see of it is round as a circle in projection against the sky. And if you look at it, uh, if you look at, 
an object and it, it bears the same appearance no matter what you, uh, which direction you see it from. It's undoubtedly a sphere. So this is a, is a spherical body, absolutely undistorted, and therefore it is um, not rotating very rapidly. Our Earth rotates once in 24 hours and it is distorted. The diameter through the poles is some 27 miles, miles shorter than the diameter through the equator. And this distortion is something that is uh, quite apparent when you uh, um, look for it. And of course, uh, since what we see of Venus, the disk, is uh, a cloudy surface, that if Venus were rotating rapidly, that would be subject to considerably more distortion than that, Just as I'm speaking now from looking at Jupiter and Saturn, which are tremendously oblate because of the well, I wouldn't lay it all to their clouds, Jim. The big planets are um, rather flexible inside, too. They're, they're elastic yeah, in the sense they flow be, some. Yeah. Yes, it's not all the atmosphere, but this is so. The atmosphere ought to reflect something of this kind. Another thing that uh, argues against a short period for the rotation is the fact that uh, uh, you can't observe one edge coming toward us and the other one going away by means of the spectrograph, the Doppler effect. Uh, just doesn't work. Um, it's been tried many a time by observers at Mount Wilson to determine uh, in the optical part of the spectrum the uh, rotation of the body, and it's just too low to be observed. Now, what does this mean? It means that the, uh, uh, the motion cannot be as large as ours because that's about a half a kilometer per second, and this could be observed. So, um, it certainly is nowhere near a day. Now there have been arguments a long time for a very long period, and um, a large number of people could argue against that. And for well, uh, several decades, there was uh, probably the least argument amongst astronomers for a period of around three weeks. This was probably the least observable <laughs> period at all, and so, uh, uh, you would find fewer to argue against that period than to argue against any of the others. Well, three weeks. Unfortunately, all these are wrong. And uh, it's only been in the last uh, uh, couple of years that we have been able to learn anything at all about the rotation period of the planet. And this has been done by uh, methods of radio astronomy in particular radar astronomy in which one sends out a pulse of radio waves and then waits for the echo to return. Now, very careful analysis of the echo is very important. For one, um, we determine the distance to Venus by observing the length of time it takes for the echo to return. Once the echo is here, we can still work on it and get more information out of it. If the body is rotating, the mirror is rotating that uh, uh, is reflecting the light to us, the radio waves, then this will alter the frequencies coming back. Um, you've played ping pong, I think, uh, on occasion, Jim. And uh, if, uh, if you really want to send the ball back to your opponent uh, with increased speed, you uh, approach the ball with vigor and uh, you add the uh, speed of your paddle to the speed of the ball and uh, send it back and it bounces very hard. If you want to drop the ball just over the net, you won't hit it so hard. And if, uh, if indeed you just wanted to stop the ball, you would probably allow the ball to strike your paddle while the paddle was going away from the ball, but not quite fast enough so that the ball could catch up. And the ball doesn't bounce very much. Well, if you think a little bit about that, you can understand how a mirror will reflect the radio waves and change their uh, frequency, as the Doppler effect does. If the mirror, the mirror point, is approaching the transmitter, the receiver, then it will increase the frequency, change the pitch to a higher pitch if you want to think in terms of sound, give more energy to it if you want to think in terms of that ball, if it's going away, why, it lags a little bit and uh, changes the pitch downward. Now, we can measure the echo for frequency effects and see what the spread in frequency is. 
this has been done for um, Venus, and the interesting part about it is it does seem to have a rotation period which is very much like the, re the revolution period. Not 225 days, but more like 250. But here's the rub. It's going the other way. It's, it's a retrograde planet. It's rotating the opposite direction from the revolution direction. So if you look at it from the north side of the solar system, that's the side that contains our north pole, it's going around the sun counterclockwise, but it is rotating clockwise. So this is a very embarrassing thing when it comes to um, people who are worried about the uh, way that the solar system was put together, because uh, it would be so much nicer if everything went the same way, but this one is going backwards, and, and this is a, is a very strange thing. Is there any, any uh, thought, or has anyone advanced a, a theory to account for that? No, uh, not yet. I think they're still quivering from the surprise. Uh, the, it, it will come in time. Somebody will work up the, the ideas for it. It's, uh, it's going to have to be one that is mathematically done. You can't yeah. just wave your hands and say, well, now it's like this. Um, that's the, uh, the trouble with most of the ideas about how the planetary system was formed. And uh, none of the ideas are any good until you can put some numbers into it and make it a physically real theory. Well, the combination of motion around the sun and around its own axis in a retrograde fashion means that uh, as far as the sun is concerned, uh, the interval between daylight and dark for any one particular place on the planet is about 125 days. It's a combination of its rotation and revolution. Right, right. So in opposite directions. You in opposite say. directions. So it, uh, it, it works out there that the sun will rise uh, in what we would think of as the west and set in what we'd think of as the east. Um, it makes no difference to the people on Venus, if any there be, <laughs> because they can't see the sky anyway and they can't see the direction of the sun. It just kind of comes up and gets bright uh, like it does here on a very hazy day where you can't see the sun. You don't know yeah. one direction from another. That's the problem with the, with the clouds. That's the problem with the rotation period. The uh, rotation period is pretty solid, too, nowadays. It's uh, uh, in 248 days with an error of plus or minus 5, and that's pretty good. Now, I indicated that the Doppler effect was one of those uh, uh, that was used. There's also... Uh, observation of some places on Venus, on the surface of Venus, which reflect a little more radio waves than others. So these are, are uh, really good mirror spots, and these do move around in such a way that uh, they adequately confirm the uh, retrograde rotation and the order of 250 days. So this is a, this is a pretty solid observation. And I might point also to the direction of the pole. Uh, the pole is roughly in the neighborhood of the star that we would find as Zeta Draconis. So it's, uh, it's up in our, in our northern hemisphere, but it's the other end of Venus, the other end of the, uh, the other axis end of Venus. Yes, it's I up mean, in that referring direction. it to its direction right. of rotation. Right. It has then an inclination of the order of 20 degrees to, uh, its um, uh, orbit. Well, when you say order of 20 degrees, that's its, its south pole. Uh, it's displaced is, is 20 up, degrees. Yes, yeah. its south pole is up, but it's, dis it's displaced. Well, if you want to take it the way that, that we do of Uranus, Uranus then uh, we'd have to make it 160 degrees. 160 degrees, yeah, 160 160 degrees. degrees uh, is the inclination. Standing on its head. Right. Right. Well, we ought to define north, uh, really, yeah. as the direction from which we could see everything going counterclockwise. And then... In that case, Venus would be uh, 160, 160 degrees. degrees. Yeah, tipped over that far. There have been other radio observations um, made down in uh, California, which are quite interesting. In the... Um, Ojai region of California, there are uh, two large 
antennas, 90 feet across, which have been used to uh, uh, measure the brightness distribution of radio waves coming from the planet. This has been done by an interferometer technique, and it involves uh, a big computer, and uh, they worked with polarization on it. They did the whole bit. They really worked hard on this. And they find a smaller planet than we can see optically. Now, the the errors are still large in this. This, this was something that's going to get refined considerably in the future. But the uh, implication is, to date, that the atmosphere is about 40 miles thick. And uh, down at the bottom of that atmosphere, that uh, the, the weight above you would be about 10 times the weight of the atmosphere here on the Earth. So instead of 14 pounds per square inch, why well, I'd say 150. 120. There is great uncertainty in this figure, however, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't push it too far. But this is uh, one of the first indications that we have had of the uh, uh, density of the atmosphere, or the thickness of, of the, the atmospheric layer uh, on Venus. What, uh, well, are, you, are you planning to talk about what the constituents m may be or should be to produce uh so dense an atmosphere, uh, such a heavy one with such, uh, sh uh, also shallow? This is a problem that is going to face the uh, cosmologists again and how they put together the solar system because um, I think it's rather impressive that uh, Venus might well be made differently from the Earth. But there's another reason for it too. Another reason to have so much stuff in the, the gaseous envelope around that planet. Many years ago, um, about 1956, there were early observations by radio techniques of the uh, heat of Venus. Earlier than that, uh, back in the 20s, there were observations of the temperature of Venus, but these referred by infrared measures to the tops of the clouds, and this is quite cold. Now, the radio observations just a decade or so ago indicate that the uh, planet is quite hot, of the order of six to seven hundred degrees. Well, that, that corresponds, uh, I believe, to some somewhat to the findings of Mariner 2. Yes, Mariner 2 confirmed this, uh, contrary to popular reports that they, uh, they made the first observation of it. They confirmed the high temperature. Now, in the several ways of looking at this planet with radio techniques, we've come to just about the same temperature. And this is very reassuring to people who make the observations. It means that we are looking at the same thing in the planet all the time, and this confirmation is very reassuring. Now, if the temperature is so high there, it is quite likely, even with a uh, high-pressure atmosphere, that the temperature of the water would be uh, very high. In fact, any water that may have evolved uh, out of the innards of Venus uh, may now be in the neighborhood of, or uh, may now be uh, steam, vapor. Yeah. And this is quite likely what the clouds are. I think water would boil at something like 300 degrees if uh, um, we uh, made the experiment under such a heavy uh, pressure, but I'm not sure of that figure. I'm going to have to look that up someday. All right, what's in the atmosphere then? If the Venus uh, surface has rearranged itself, uh, the whole body, the bulk of Venus has rearranged itself like the Earth has, the central material being quite dense, lighter stuff coming to the top, including water, then it's likely that there's a tremendous amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Curiously enough, it's been very difficult to detect at the tops of the clouds. They may be pretty icy there, and the vapor may be very hard to come by. The constituents in the atmosphere, other than the clouds, those detected are only carbon dioxide. So I think carbon dioxide and water vapor are quite prominent in the cloud, in the atmosphere, of this planet. Did the pass of Mariner 2 into any information? Mariner. Yes, Mariner 2 gave quite a little bit of information <laughs> about the, uh, uh, the body. Some of the experiments were not successful, however. The, uh, one of the problems was to try to find out just how 
uh, the heat was distributed around this body. They found that the heat was not in the atmosphere. It really did come from the solid body of the planet. And this was a, uh, uh, a good thing to have fixed because it, uh, it threw out a lot of theories that weren't worth the effort and uh, which would have been if the uh, observations had turned the other way around. One of the interesting things that Mariner 2 did uh, give us was the fact that there's no magnetic field around Venus, at least at the 21,000 miles out on the sunward side that uh, Mariner went through. Now, if this is so, um, it just kind of confirms the idea that uh, Venus does not rotate very rapidly. Well, this was, I, this was information available um, before the rotation period came. Why do I say that? Because the uh, central conditions in the planet must be molten, fluid, as they are on the Earth, and the body must rotate. Yeah. Well, if Venus is about the same size as the Earth, it's got about 85% the mass of the Earth, it's uh, just slightly smaller than the Earth, and thus it may well have the same internal constitution, but it doesn't rotate, so there's no magnetic field. One wonders about the tremendous heat on Venus. There are two ways of getting heat into a body in, in the solar system. One of them is by the heat from the outside, the sun. Now, Venus uh, runs around the sun at... Uh, a distance which is 72 percent the distance of the earth and therefore it ought to receive uh, quite a little bit more heat than we get here however the clouds reflect a tremendous amount of energy that's why Venus looks so bright to us it doesn't reflect everything however and the Sun does send out a large amount of uh, radiation in all parts of the spectrum it is possible that uh, a lot of this energy nevertheless does get down to the surface of Venus and that it heats the surface considerably. The carbon dioxide is a curious uh, constituent to have in an atmosphere here because it prevents the cooling of the surface. A little bit like the greenhouse uh, and the glass. Yeah. The ordinary light from the sun comes down through the glass heating the insides, and now then the insides, being nice and warm, would like to get rid of some of this energy. But um, the material inside will re-radiate the energy at a wavelength which the glass uh, will not transmit, and therefore it traps it. So the carbon dioxide acts like the gas, the, carbon, the uh, glass, in the greenhouse, and we get a greenhouse effect. Now, this is one way of heating the surface. Another is that the inside of the planet is probably radioactive and the natural decay of the radioactive elements is uh, adding to the temperature. The temperature is still something of a problem to try and account for, but uh, this is a, a way in which we're uh, beginning to really attack the problem. Well, the, the very fact of the slow rotation would tend to, to cook the sunward side, certainly, uh, a little bit considerably more than the, than the effect we get on Earth. Yes, the atmosphere uh, would get heated up by the sun, and the slow rotation uh, would cause some uh, interesting atmospheric winds. But uh, I think we'll probably have to wait to get there to be able to analyze them carefully. There have been some continent-sized dark regions appearing in the cloudy structure, but uh, seen only in ultraviolet light. These really seem to be depressions in the cloud layer because we can see more carbon dioxide in these dark regions than in others. But a study of these is going to have to tell us more about the nature of the distribution of atmosphere and the uh, heating problems that occur on Venus. Thank you both very much. We have been listening to astronomer Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin and Mr. James S. Pickering, assistant astronomer and supervisor of guest relations at the American Museum Hayden Planetarium, discussing the physics of Venus. We hope you will be with us next week when Dr. Franklin will return with Dr. William Calder, professor of physics and astronomy at Agnes Scott College, Decatur, Georgia. 
The topic of their discussion will be Astronomy at Agnes Scott College. We hope you will join us, and if you have any questions or topics you would like discussed on future Armchair Astronomy programs, indicate them by card or letter to Armchair Astronomy, WBAI, 30 East 39th Street, New York 16, New York. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in future programs. Until next week, good day. This has been Armchair Astronomy with members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff talking to WBAI's David W. Teske.